The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. We're just going to wait a few more minutes to give more people an opportunity to log in, so uh, please bear with us for a few minutes. Thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to be uh, starting here in just a few minutes. We're just giving some more time for people to uh, get logged in and uh, queued into today's webinar, so uh, bear with us for another minute or so. <coughs> Hello, for those who are just joining us, uh, we're going to give it uh, one more minute to give a few more people the opportunity to log in before we get started today, so we'll be right with you. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Randy Vanderhoof. I'm the Executive Director for the Smart Card Alliance. I'd like to thank everyone for choosing to spend part of their morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're located, with the Smart Card Alliance and our team of payments industry experts for today's webinar on EMV for merchants and merchants acquirers. By the number of advanced registrations we received, over 600, there is obviously great interest in this topic in the United States, and we know that the entire global payments industry is watching with great interest in what is happening in the U.S. with respect to the issuers, the merchants, and the merchant acquirers around the subject of EMV. Next slide. <clears throat> Before we begin, a brief introduction to those people who may not be familiar with the Smart Card Alliance organization. We are a multi-industry, multi-stakeholder organization whose mission is to stimulate the awareness, understanding, adoption, and further the widespread usage of Smart Card technology with a focus on North America and Latin America. We have over 190 member organizations. Those organizations span the payments marketplace from the financial payments brands and issuers retail acceptance, transportation and mobile payments markets, and also the non-payments markets involving identity and security for government and commercial markets and all of the technology providers and integrators that span all of these market segments. We use a council structure to organize our member activities around key smart card technology and vertical markets. We have five semi-autonomous councils, a payments council, healthcare, identity, physical access, and transportation. Our councils were supported by 472 individual participants last year, 
and they combine to produce 39 projects, including white papers, industry comments, webinars, workshops, physical meetings, and other tools and resources. All of our conference events and webinars are open to the public, and these council deliverables are available free of charge through the Alliance website, which averages about 80,000 visits per month and over a million on an annual basis. Next slide. <clears throat> Today's EMV webinar is a product of the Payments Council. This council has been particularly active and productive in the past year, with 62 individual organizations contributing and co-chaired by two of our presenters today, Simon Hurry of Visa and Oliver Manahan of MasterCard Worldwide. In 2011 alone, this council has split its energy between the major payments trends that are happening in the U.S. market, namely involving contactless payments acceptance, NFC mobile payments, and now EMV. They produce several excellent products, including the Card Payments Roadmap White Paper last February, Contactless Payments Security Question and Answers in March, an EMV Frequently Asked Questions report in August, and set up extensive EMV resources pages with additional content. They created an active Smart.Payments LinkedIn social networking group, which now has over 650 members. And this group is not totally insular by nature. They engage regularly with other groups that are standards bodies, other payments groups like the ETA and NACHA, security groups, mobile groups such as the NFC Forum and the GSMA, and most importantly, our merchant groups, the Merchant Advisory Group, or MAG, and the National Retail Federation, to name a few. Next slide. So let's get started by introducing today's presenters for this EMV webinar. I'll be handing off to Oliver Manahan, Vice President, MasterCard Worldwide, and one of our Payments Council co-chairs, who will then be followed by Guy Berg, Global Industry Consultant at DataCard Group, Simon Hurry, Senior Business Leader for Visa Incorporated and also our Payments Council co-chair, and then Amaris Matar, the Chief Technology Officer for Moneris Solutions. Next slide. <clears throat> the topics for today's webinar will include global EMV deployments and results, as well as the business drivers for U.S. migration to EMV and key choices in EMV implementation that will be led by Oliver Manahan, followed by an EMV 101, how do EMV payments processes differ from magnetic stripe transactions, what are the issuer EMV options and their implementations for card acceptance, and what are the key considerations for EMV implementation led by Guy Berg. That will be followed by an overview of Visa's announcement about their U.S. migration approach and the next steps for their merchants and acquirers that Simon Hurry will present. And then we'll finish with an overview of the acquirer and merchants lessons learned from the Canadian EMV migration that Amara is going to be sharing with us. I'll return at the end of the, uh, today's webinar with a question and answer session. And on your GoToWebinar web interface, you'll notice that there's a place to submit your questions to our presenters. I would encourage you to submit your questions during the webinar rather than saving them all to the end so that we can receive them and organize them ahead of time so that we can get to as many of these questions as possible. Next slide. So now let me uh, turn this webinar over to our first presenter, Oliver Manahan. Oliver? Yeah, thanks, Randy, and uh, thank you to everybody for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to attend the webinar today. So my goal is simply to set sort of the high-level, you know, global deployment, the, um, the, the high level of uh, business drivers, things like that, but then really turn it over to Guy, Simon, and Amher uh, for more detail on their specific items as, uh, as Randy just went through. So, Kathy, uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this, uh, this particular slide was pulled from the uh, EMV Co. website. And EMV is sort of the standards body for financial card chip payments. And these, 
numbers that are displayed here are a little bit out of date in that they're Q1 2011. It really takes a long time to compile all the card, device, uh, ATM numbers from, from around the globe, but I'll just do a quick sort of status of where the various major regions indicated here are. So the, the light blue is, is Europe, and 74% of cards and 89% of terminals. I can tell you that uh, with recent uh, regulatory moves from the European Payments Council, those numbers are much closer to 90% on both sides of cards and terminals and frankly ATMs as well. So while not 100% done, Europe is very close to being uh, complete from a, a chip enablement perspective. I won't spend as much time sort of on the Asia-Pacific, Africa, uh, APMEA, Latin America perspective. Uh, on the three bottom ones there, I'll point out that, you know, you've got 12% of cards, 65% of devices, 27% of cards, 43% of devices, and 17 and 60. So all of those, you know, followed the sort of chicken and egg question, which do you put out first, the device or the card? So clearly in those regions, it was a, a perspective of let's get the devices out there, and once the device is out there, the cards will, will catch up. So had we looked at this slide six or 12 months ago, the card numbers were very, very minimal. So the card numbers are actually picking up quite aggressively um, in answer to the fact that there is uh, acceptance locations both at point of sale and ATM. And then finally, they've um, grouped Latin America and Canada together where there are 31% of cards and 76% of terminals. And I can, it, each one has sort of geographical um, drivers and so it, particularly Brazil and Mexico are fairly highly concentrated with chip deployments now and what tends to happen is a bit of a domino effect whereby um, as one country migrates the bordering countries uh, look look at their potential fraud impact if the fraud migrates from one country to another and says you know what probably the right time for us to start looking at this which means that Peru Colombia etc start looking at a chip migration and Finally, to the, the far north there, Canada, where I'm from, we had the exact same perspective of, you know, we're only 4% of the, the, the global payment market, so if we start taking a disproportional amount of fraud from Europe, Asia Pacific, Latin America, uh, et cetera, then that could be particularly disruptive to our payment system. In other words, um, a lot more fraud than we've ever experienced before. So. Well, it doesn't break out Canada specifically, we're sort of in the 70% card, 70% devices, and we really have a push towards dual interface cards and contactless acceptance, uh, largely because it was just a matter of good timing. There wasn't a lot of contactless in the marketplace when Europe started their contact chip migration, but we just happened to hit that sort of sweet spot to say if you're doing an infrastructure upgrade, this may well be the right time to look at contactless as well as the contact upgrade, and then the issuer can decide whether or not to put the functionality of contactless on their card. So next slide, please, uh, Kathy. So some of the business drivers, and um, you know, whether these are business drivers or things to think about, you know, perhaps open to uh, discussion, but specifically from a merchant perspective, I think the, the first sort of question to be asked is what sort of uh, deployment do I have in my stores right now? Is it something that's 10 years old that has absolutely no hope of being upgraded or is it something that's been purchased relatively recently that may actually have the chip slot on it so it's hardware capable, in which case um, the next uh, question is what will it take to get the software and the network upgraded? So the next point is that chip brings a lot more data and most of this data is specific to ensuring that the transaction has a much lower risk profile. So um, the chip can create cryptographic data that um, gets, gets passed through the network uh, that can be evaluated either by the network brand or by the issuer themselves to say yes I absolutely know that this was signed transaction from my card and perhaps a PIN was validated or perhaps a signature was validated. So to be able to carry that extra data, of course, is then an upgrade to the internal systems, potentially to your network, um, concentrator, store server, those sorts of things. And um, so the next piece is that around any significant project like this means that there's going to be testing, you know, both of the hardware, the software, the um, 
regression testing, use cases, all of that sort of stuff. And then, of course, all the training. So that, you know, from a standalone merchant's perspective, it may be as simple as you get a new device, you plug it in, and there's a little sheet that says follow these five steps. But for major um, retailers, it can come down to uh, ensuring that the, the store is fully trained in any sort of new feature that comes along, whether it's a loyalty program or whatever. So you know, it can be um, just another piece of a, a project plan to ensure that the training is done. And on the benefit side, um, clearly the, the reason that other markets have moved to chip is to reduce fraud. So uh, there's a lot of talk about liability shift and things like that. The goal is not to shift liability. The goal is actually to reduce fraud from the system. And if you can reduce fraud from the system, then you can reduce some of those other um, rather expensive and annoying things like I just got a request for copy to make sure that the person actually signed their receipt or that the transaction was validated properly and the potential of chargeback. So if you have that fraud out of the system, then you can also reduce all of those operational costs around uh, requests for copies, etc. It's also an opportunity to optimize processes. So I know um, I won't go much into this. I think Amber's got a bit more on it. But you know, as you're pulling out hardware and software and all of those sorts of things, it's always an ideal time to look at how things have worked over the past 10, 15, 20 years, and what can we do to improve the processes. And finally, an improvement in checkout speed. And, and I haven't seen um, qualitative or quantitative data in this in, in a while, but as you move to a more uniform um, checkout, i.e. you insert your card and you follow the prompts and you remove your card, it can be a bit different than swiping your card and potentially pressing a button for credit or a button for debit, and then looking for a flat place to sign, and oh, where's the pen, et cetera. So those sorts of things can remove a few seconds from a transaction, and again, depending on the type of retailer, uh, can have a fairly instrumental uh, impact in the on the bottom line. The next slide, please, Kathy. So some of the key choices, and I, I referenced this briefly in Canada, so as, as a merchant, there's a potential just to say, you know what, I, I think the contact chip is the right thing to do. Um, it's what's been adopted in many other markets of the world. But you know, if you're already opening up systems, networks, introducing new hardware into your retailer space, then perhaps this is also the time to look at contactless. And maybe not from the historic perspective of I've got a card to tap and what value does that bring, but more from the future perspective of NFC, mobile phones, and um, by all accounts, it looks like this is a, an, a payment method that's, that's about to take off or on the cusp of taking off, in which case it brings out all sorts It brings other options like, um, you know, couponing, offering, geopositional locators, things like, or geopositional offers as you're walking along, here's, a, here's an offer. So, you know, really that question of if I'm going to absorb some expense to upgrade, is it worth taking that next step and upgrading for the next piece? Um, support for online only or offline as well. So CHIP, if nothing else, introduces a whole lot of choices and particular markets have made particular choices. Uh, one of them is, do you send every transaction online, uh, which requires brand public keys to do um, offline cryptography and the maintenance of those keys? Um, is, or, or do you do offline as well, which in particular markets may have particular benefits? So one of those considerations. And the other one is um, from the cardholder verification method perspective, uh, EMV introduces um, offline PIN, historically online PIN signature and no cardholder verification method uh, has existed in the past. So offline PIN is another potential option. So it becomes a question of what to support and what's the best sort of for the overall industry drivers. And with that, I will turn it over to Guy who has the uh, unenviable task of trying to go through EMV in 10 minutes. So over to you, Guy. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, as Oliver indicated, that uh, it's my challenge to present EMV within 10 minutes. And uh, there's a lot to deal with EMV, and we could probably spend a whole day on this. So 
my objective is really to provide a base level understanding of the components involved in the EMV migration. So when most people think of EMV, they tend to think of just the chip in the card. But as you'll see on the next slide, there's a lot more to EMV than the chip in the card. Please proceed, Kathy. So on this slide, you can see that you start out with the chip. And from once you insert the chip in the terminal, there's two things that are happening. The chip is doing some risk assessment, and the terminal also is doing some risk assessment. At the end of that risk assessment, which is based on how the issuers define what we call the EMV tags or the EMV profile, then there will be an, a dynamic cryptogram that's created. And that will get passed into a new set of EMV authentication data. So that means that the whole messaging um, system has to be updated to facilitate bringing that additional EMV data and this online dynamic cryptogram. And that will get passed all the way to the issuer authorization system, at which point in time the issuer will then validate that online dynamic cryptogram and may send a response back that is oftentimes referred to as ARPC, or response cryptogram, that goes all the way back to the chip, and the chip then is able to authenticate the issuer. So in other words, there's a mutual authentication going on. The issuer can authenticate the chip, and the chip can authenticate the issuer. Now with a contactless card, that last step of the ARPC often you know, generally is not performed because the card will have been removed from the field of communication before a response could be returned to it. So in the essence of this particular slide, the thing to note is that when implementing EMV, there's not just the chip, there's changes to the terminal, there's changes to the messaging, and there's changes to the authorization process at the end of the line. So from this point, I'm going to go into a few of these components of the process into a little bit more detail. So next slide, please. So the first thing is looking at it from a card perspective. And on the card perspective, there's three primary components. First, on the upper left-hand side, there's the chip operating system. And there's actually many different chip operating systems that are out there. And each of the card vendors go to the issuers, and they're selling to those issuers either their proprietary chip operating system, or it might be an open system, such as Global Platform or the Multo system. Now, it really doesn't matter to the terminals, it doesn't matter to the acquirers, it doesn't really matter to the issuers, for the most part, what the operating system is. If you move over to the right-hand side, this is where we have a listing of the brand-specific implementations of EMV. So to understand this, EMV is a broad specification or set of standards. And just like any set of standards, there's many options in how you can implement it. So in this case, in EMV, each of the brands have chosen slightly different implementations of those particular standards. And they've implemented slightly different for contactless as well as for content. So you can see in this slide that for Visa, there's a PayWave contactless EMV. And then there's a VSDC contact EMV. And for MasterCard, they have a contactless and also a contact. And that's true for each brand that implements EMV. So the third level from the card architecture is the data level. At the data level, this is where each issuer is given the option to choose um, what parts of EMV they, do they want to implement. So those choices that Oliver referred to, you know, do they want to implement offline authentication support? Do they just want to do online support? What forms of card verification method do they want to implement? Do they want to have online, or should say offline EMV? Um, do they want to just have signature? What form of cardholder verification do they want to implement? And that information is established at the time of personalization and programmed to the chip. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So the next slide, we start to look at the terminal perspective. So the terminal, in many respects, is like the chip itself because every terminal vendor has its own terminal operating system. Now, on top of that, to support EMV, each of the vendors have had to implement what is called an EMV kernel. So that's the baseline EMV logic that's required to accept EMV cards. Now, once they implement that, they need to provide those terminals or send those terminals. And this is each model of terminal that they have. They need to um, 
send to EMV code to have them tested and certified before they can be released. Now, that's just the first level of testing. Now, if you look at the, the sh light blue shaded um, rectangles on this diagram, you see for each brand, for Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, and each other brand that there is around the world, since they've implemented even be slightly differently at the chip level, that means at the terminal level, there's slightly different processing that has to be performed. Now, to make sure that everything works correctly, what has happened is that each of the brands have implemented certain test requirements for the terminals in a certification process. So not only do the terminals get tested and certified at the EMV kernel level, but they also get tested and certified at the brand level. And that's both for contact and contactless implementation to make sure that every flavor of EMV can be accepted at terminal. This is a very important point. So the acquirers and terminal vendors, before they can roll out uh, a terminal, they need to make sure that for every brand card that's going to be accepted by that terminal, that terminal needs to be certified. Next slide, please. Now, in the next slide, we're going back to the chip side of things. So when we think about the chip um, implementation of EMV, there's a set of risk management criteria, and that governs basically both an offline transaction security and an online transaction security. And these are options for the issuers. Um, <clears throat> so if we proceed one step further here, there's also a PIN option. So as an issuer, by setting this risk management criteria, they can say that we're interested in implementing online only, or we're interested in implementing a combination of online and offline. And if they choose to do a combination of offline and online, they have a further option as part of the card verification methods to choose to support offline PIN. Now, there also is the ability to support offline PIN for an EMV card, I'm sorry, online PIN. But online PIN is really a process that's completely outside of EMV. In other words, in today's environment, uh, most debit cards, if not all debit cards, support PIN at ATM. That's an online PIN process, meaning the PIN is stored in the host system. That exact same process can be supported with an EMV implementation. Uh, and in most debit card implementations, that online PIN process is supported. On the offline side for the PIN, what EMV offers is either the ability to carry a PIN in the clear on the chip, or to carry it in an encrypted form, depending upon the chip operating system type that the issuer has selected to, to roll out. And so PIN is performed um, and validated offline before it would go online. Next slide, please. OK, so now I'm going to step through uh, a typical online EMV authentication. And the, the key component of this is what is called a dynamic cryptogram. So when a card is inserted into the terminal, next step please, either it's inserted to the terminal or if it's a contactless card, it would be tapped. What happens is a dynamic cryptogram is generated and that is sent through the new EMV data messaging layer all the way down to the issuer's authorization host. At that point, that online dynamic cryptogram is validated. And if it's a contact card, then a um, authentication response cryptogram will be sent back to the terminal. Next step, please. And that's indicated in this red line going back. Now, if it's a contactless card, as I mentioned earlier, um, the card is probably going to be removed from the field of communications before any type of response can be sent back to the card. So in a contactless implementation, implementation this last step with the ARPC typically is not performed. So again, the essence of this particular diagram is online EMV authentication is really this online dynamic cryptogram that gets generated at the time the card is presented to the terminal and authenticated by the issuer. Next slide, please. So this is the last slide that pulls it all together. So if someone decided they wanted to implement both a online and an offline authentication process, if you look at the slide to the right, 
says offline authentication and has SDA, DDA, and CDA. These are three different forms of offline authentication. Each of them progressively gets more secure. So SDA stands for static data authentication, DDA stands for dynamic data authentication, and CDA stands for combined data authentication. Now at this point when the card is presented, um, if there's a PIN involved in it, then the, um, the cardholder would enter their PIN. That would be validated. And then the next step would be for the transaction to go online and perform that exact same process that we spoke about in the previous slide. And again, if it's a contact card, an ARPC or authentication response cryptogram would be returned back to the chip where the chip can authenticate the issuer. Um, or if it's a contactless card, that last, last step is not performed. So this is at a, at a high level sort of this, the foundation of EMV and describes you know, the areas where changes are required. So next will be Simon Hurry presenting Visa's perspective on EMV rollout. Thank you, Guy. Uh, <clears throat> when I saw the title of your slide, EMV in 10 minutes, I thought, not possible. Well, you've just proved me wrong, so w well done there. It was a pretty tough challenge that you had, and uh, I think you nailed it. What I'd like to do is clarify some of the, uh, of the visa announcements with regard to the uh, chip acceleration uh, project. Next slide, please, um, Kathy. Um, <clears throat> and in addition, what I want to do is, is, is take a, a little bit of a closer look at some of the network impacts uh, for migrating to chip. And then lastly, take a bird's eye view of, of what um, acquirers and merchants may need to look for if they decide to embark on a chip program. Next slide, please. So uh, before I get into the uh, EMV aspect or the EMV topic, I, I, what I'd like to stress is, is that EMV is not going to happen overnight. It's not something that you can simply uh, switch on and, and everything is there. And so in the interim, we will continue to look for a layered approach to security. And by that I mean some of the other um, technologies that are in place today will continue to be in place with respect to securing transactions. So we will continue to support uh, data elimination uh, as well as encryption uh, uh, while or during the process of moving towards dynamic authentication or a dynamic uh, online cryptogram to secure transactions. Next slide, please. So at a very high level, um, this slide contains the gist of the announcement that Visa has made. And there are really two components to it that are of significance. The first is the Technology Innovation Program, also um, known as TIP. And I think the second uh, component is, is, the, is the liability shift component. And again, um, as Oliver pointed out very clearly, the, the liability shift mechanism is there to reduce fraud and, and, and should be viewed as such. Um, looking at what's happened globally, the, the technology innovation program, in fact, ha was announced for the rest of the world in early 2011. So that's actually been in place. But there is a, there are some, some slight differences between the global announcement and the U.S. announcement, which I'll get to in, in the next slide. But I think what's um, probably most important to look at is the 2013 mandate for acquirers and acquirer processes to support the additional data required for a chip transaction that was so well explained by Guy in, in the previous presentation. Next slide, please, Kathy. So the, the primary difference between the U.S. Technology Innovation Program and the rest of the world is that we have this unique opportunity, again, as, as, as Oliver was saying, to, to really try and um, promote contactless payments and, and, and mobile NFC. And so while um, the rest of the world had largely focused on contact chip programs, we in the U.S are choosing to focus on both. And so what we're trying to do is encourage the deployment of both contact as well as contactless terminals. And where contact is you know, ideal for a secure high ticket um, payments, you may want to support contactless 
either for mobile payments or for a speed and convenience, a faster transaction um, experience. Next slide, please. What is key in our message is that regardless of whether you're looking at contact chip deployment, dual interface, in other words, contact and contactless, or mobile acceptance, what is really critical to understand is that whichever form factor is being used in your point of sale environment, the changes that are required with respect to carrying the chip data are exactly the same whether you're doing mobile, contactless, or contact. And I think this is very important to understand because what it means is if you do decide to embark on a chip program, and whether that is contact only, contactless, or both, the network infrastructure changes that are required between the point of sale environment, the merchant server, the acquirer, and then the acquirer through the brands to the issuer are all the same. In, in other words, it's, it's one change which will set you up to basically carry chip data for any of the three form factors. And I think this is very important because if you're going to get under the hood on, uh, on your network in terms of making these changes, um, you, should, you have the opportunity to at least set yourself up for all three form factors at the same time. Next slide, please. Now, given that I also only have 10 minutes, I won't be able to go into detail on this particular slide. It is a busy slide. But I did want to put it out there. And, and of course, once these uh, presentations are, are made available, you can look at the uh, implementation considerations in more detail. But I wanted, I wanted to highlight a few of them that are, I think, very important to take note of. The first thing, and, and again, Guy Berg touched on this in his presentation, is you really want to evaluate what your point of sale brand requirements are in terms of what it is that you're going to be supporting. So as Guy was pointing out, if you decide to support a contactless program as well as a contact program, make sure that you talk to your terminal vendor and make sure that they support all of the brand applications uh, pertaining to contactless that you would choose to support based on your business requirements. So I wanted to emphasize that up front, and I think Guy did a pretty good job of doing that as well. At the same time, make sure that you're aware of the brand requirements, especially uh, with respect to what test tools and what testing is mandated or mandatory in order to achieve certification for that particular application. And um, in most cases, there are links to, to, to websites where you can find more information about the, the tools that are available for your testing. But I can't emphasize enough how important testing is. Um, and then once you've, once you've decided to move forward and you've gone through your testing certification uh, phase, it is also important to make sure that you at least do a soft launch at a couple of locations, make sure that, that um, these terminals are working for all the applications that you've chosen to support. And again, in that case, you may want to look for some of the tools available that would allow you to test uh, different cards or, in fact, even different uh, mobile phone applications from not just the US, but from other parts of the world as well. Uh, next slide. So just in brief summary, before I, I hand over to Amor, so really, I think the message here is that the rest of the world has moved to chip, and the US looks like we're certainly embarking in that direction. Again, the, the two primary drivers for this are innovation, the ability to do payment applications in new form factors and add value to, to, to the transaction, as well as to increase data security, and, and reduce fraud. And with that, I'd like to hand off to uh, Amr to uh, give his perspective on, on the Canadian experience. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'll start off by just uh, touching a bit, a bit on who Mineris is. We're uh, Canada's largest acquirer. We're a joint venture between Royal Bank and Bank of Montreal. and uh, 
we um, we we are we're the um, we're the market leader in terms of um, in terms of acquiring in Canada with large merchants as well as small merchants. Just touch a little bit on, on our EMV implementation. We've got over 250,000 endpoints in the Canadian marketplace today. 180,000 of these are standalone terminals and 60. 60,000 plus on the integrated side, and I'll talk a little bit why that why that breakdown uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so the first slide, please, Kathy. Uh, thank you. So um, this here, what what I just wanted to touch on a few points. The moving to AMV is an industry-wide change. Issuers will have to issue the cards. Consumers will have to basically e either cards or mobile phones. Uh, consumers will will behave with these differently than what they do with Max Stripe cards. Merchants will also behave differently today. A lot of the merchants take your card, swipe it, swipe it, and complete the payment. And in, in in an EMV world, the consumer is is basically um, in, has has a hold of their cards, and they should be inserting that into the terminal or tapping it uh, to the contactless reader. Uh, so they're in control. So there's some behavioral changes. Acquirers and processors have many different uh, changes on the technology side, and obviously the brands are the ones that are coming up with the specific implementations of EMV. Um, I think what's critical is to understand the goal, and Simon Simon did a good job of, of stating what Visa's goals are, which are um, part of them is to move the innovation forward with contactless and, and contact-based EMV. The others are on fraud with the liability shift. So, Understanding the goal, understanding what the other brand goals are, and putting that into perspective as you are implementing is clearly critical on how you move forward. The last item here is uh, from our Canadian experience has been uh, fairly important for the implementation in Canada. That's working together. Um, in Canada, we we have uh, we have brought together uh, the acquirers, the brands, the issuer in in a. Uh, in a multilateral uh, fashion to to create consistency and to agree on what will be implemented in the marketplace and even with that it, it, there was some anomalies that were, were uh, that were needed to be dealt with in the UK uh, they've used um, a, an, um, a multilateral approach to and that was uh, that was an association called or, or a group that was called apex that now has become sort of an ongoing um, ongoing um, association that deals with card issuing and acquiring. Um, and why I mention this is the USA obviously is a huge market, and there may be some uh, some reservation about using a multilateral approach. But don't don't be scared to to approach it that way, because um, at the end of the day, it'll help you implement something that makes sense for both uh, for everybody in the in the equation. Next slide, please, Kathy. Things to keep in mind: understand the challenge. The challenge. Uh, it's a uh, it's a big te technology uh, change for for acquirers, merchants. Um, I talked about you know we've got 250,000 endpoints, and you know the Canadian Canadian population is probably probably about uh, one tenth of that in the U.S. So you know you can multiply that by ten. Uh, by ten to get to, to get a view of what you will have to do in the in, in terms of terminals. Now there's there's some discussion whether whether terminals and technology needs to be changed or not. But uh, but for example, if you are thinking of deploying contactless, uh, then you know there that that would necessitate a change because if the merchants don't have it today, you'd have to to deploy contactless readers or uh, integrated or not. So that necess necessitates a change. The point here. It is a big technology change. We started um, we started in 2005, and we are still going some of the major merchants. There are reasons why it's taking us a long time, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, do it once, meaning you know the Canadian experience, and this is what I wanted to get into. Um, the brands announced at different times, so there was one brand in 2004, followed by. Two others in 2007 or 2008, and then followed by by another in 2010, and another just just uh, again in 2010. So the idea here is uh, because the brands came at different times, there's been ongoing work on the acquirer side, and the merchant side, and and some of the issuers to uh, to rework some of the programs. And and the implementation in the U.S. does not need to have that complexity. 
if you um, if if uh, if there's a multilateral and multi-brand approach to this where uh, there's some synchronization, it, the timeline could be could be shaved off and and could be much uh, much more compact. Um, and this leads into the inter-brand uh, harmonization, which is basically it it would it would benefit the whole U.S. market if there was some harmonization between the brands. Um, EM, EMV Co versus the brands. Uh, the key point here is EMV Co sets the standards, and then the brands um, brands implement the specific programs that are associated with them. And I think Simon did a good job of of describing the visa specific program. Um, and and I think uh, Guy did a great great uh, job in describing EMV in general. So uh, so the point here is there will be differences between what EMV Co as a standard is and what some of the brands will do in terms of their implementation. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. So where do you start? Um, research and there's lots lots to learn from. So the EMV Co website is probably a good place to start in terms of getting some of the documents. Uh, one of the good ones is a guide to EMV that will give you a good a good starting point to where what you need to understand, what you need to do. Um, research the EMV Co website even further than that if you wanted some further detail. I would say the brands is another good place to to start by understanding their specific implementations. In, in in the US and maybe you know maybe you want to take a look at the Canadian experience as well and see what's what happened uh, north of the border the um, engage the brands understand from the brands what uh, what you would need to do uh, to get their programs supported um, and again if there could be inter inter harmonization between the brands that would ben benefit everybody uh, to, to comp to, uh, to compress the timeline um, the industry experience, the good news is that the U.S. Is, is not the first to move on to EMV, and there's a lot of experience um, in places like the uh, like Europe, the U.K., um, Asia, um, the Middle East, and most recently, I would say Canada. And so there's uh, there's a lot of similarities between our um, our our markets here in Canada and the U.S. in terms of integrated merchants versus standalone merchants, and there's probably a lot of a lot of common things that can be learned um, that you can learn from from what has happened north of the border. In terms of commitment, you know, there's uh, the point here is this is a, this is a big effort. It does not have to be a super difficult effort, and 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 how you get that actually accomplished much simpler than what has been done in the rest of the world is is by committing to it and putting a lot of planning into it before you uh, you go into an implementation. Next uh, slide, please. So on the implementation considerations, one of the first things that happened in the Canadian marketplace um, and, and was really helpful is, is describing the roles and responsibilities. What, what's the role of the issuer? What's the role of the acquirer? What's the acquirer going to do? What's the expectation of the merchant? And et cetera, et cetera. And it's just really uh, crystallized in the Canadian market what's, what's expected from everybody to get a successful implementation. As you move into chip, one of the important uh, considerations to 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 look at is whether uh, whether the U.S. will implement a pilot uh, a pilot to test out the experience between consumers, merchants, uh, issuers, etc., and the brands as well. And um, and that's one thing that benefited the Canadian marketplace uh, tremendously. I would say there was a there was a there were there were market pilots done. In, a, in an area north of Toronto, probably about 45 minutes from Toronto, as well as north of Montreal, probably an hour north of Montreal. And it allowed early, early experiences and, um, and it allowed for early learnings from inconsistencies of implementation. So the consumer experience was not the same in all situations. And these were taken back and then corrected. Uh, likewise, the same from a merchant experience, um, et cetera, et cetera. And what it allowed is is sort of a, um, a a less expensive rollout because if these things went out on mass and then had to be brought back in to be fixed, it would have meant uh, it would have meant much larger expenses. The 80-20 rule. What this talks about is our experience in Canada has been that you could, yeah, from an acquire perspective, you can get to address the small merchants where they have a standalone standalone 
uh, solution much faster than you can in the integrated space. And that goes back to my initial number, which I said we have 180,000 endpoints that are standalone and 60 plus thousand points that are integrated. And the reason for that is a lot of the major merchants are still going through the integrations as, as, uh, as we move along. Um, so the integrated experience is a little bit more complex uh, because they have to change they, they have to change software in the cash register. They, they have to implement some software in the pin pads or, or the contact or the wireless terminal that's attached to the, to the cash register. And these changes are normally um, have, have to have budget, budgets uh, discussed within the large merchants as well as um, timelines and large projects associated with them. Whereas the smaller merchants, which are controlled by either the ISOs or the or the acquires are much easier to roll out once you get the terminal ready. Industry specific verticals is one of our learnings in, in, in Canada. That speaks to, <clears throat> to changing behavior in some of the industries. The two examples that I'll give you there are restaurants and um, T&E, maybe hotels, for example. So in the restaurant space today, the experience in the US or Canada, um, previously in Canada, would have been that you, when you pay on a credit card, you'd give your card, and the waiter goes back in the in in the uh, in the back kitchen or uh, on the counter and, and processes your payments, then then comes back with your receipt. With the move to to EMV, uh, there may be a change of behavior, and that's certainly in Canada, uh, a change of behavior of the terminal coming to the table, and so um, that's not only important because. It's, it's changing the infrastructure. It's also important because in a, in, a, in a large restaurant, what you may end up with are more terminals than what they have today. So today they may have one or two. But if you have, if you have 10 or 20 waiters moving around, you may need three or four. So that's a little bit of a different, uh, different implementation, different behavior. Likewise, in hotels today, um, the, you know, there, there, are, there isn't that uh, contact with the payment terminal. It's taken uh, you know, it's taken behind the counter, they swipe your card, they return it to you. Uh, as we talked about before, with a move to EMV and chip, one, the, the consumer is in control of the card and they should be inserting that card into the pin pad. So that there is a different implementation that will happen in the TNE. Um, last but not least, the acquired have quite a bit of work to do. They, you know, in, in my view, they have a major role to play in this. And, uh, and the preparation that has to happen is on the switching platforms, um, on passing the transactions through to clearing, on enabling the terminals, and then guiding, uh, guiding the small merchants in their redeployments or their ISOs in their redeployments, as well as working heavily with the large merchants and the integrators in terms of getting the software ready and then preparing for the rollout. So I can't under, um, under, you know, under represent the, uh, the role that the acquirers play, but it's a major role. And that's, uh, that's it for what I wanted to talk about. I think I'm passing it back to Randy. So Randy, it's in your hands. Yes, thank you, Amir. Also, I'd like to, I'd like to wish uh, um, thanks to Simon Hurry from Visa and Guy Berg from Datacard and Oliver Manahan from MasterCard for the great content that they shared with us today. Uh, it certainly is a challenge to cover a topic as complex as this in one hour, and we hope that we've at least provided you with a primer for some of the information that you um, are looking for. And uh, we plan to continue to bring um, much more information to you in the future. <clears throat> We're now going to enter into our um, Q&A session. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the few minutes that we have left. Um, if we do run out of time before your question is raised, um, you're welcome to contact me or the speakers that are uh, uh, presenting today individually, and we'll try to respond to as many of your questions as, as possible. Next slide. <clears throat> so uh, beginning with the uh, first question for the panel, and I think this one um, is a question about, uh, about security. Um, do you feel that um, there's capabilities in EMV that um, apply to card not present uh, online transactions, as well as what we've talked about today with um, with physical card present transactions. Maybe Guy, you might be able to uh, address that. 
Uh, yeah, that's actually a, a, an interesting uh, question and a very challenging one at that. I think there, as Simon mentioned in his presentation, the good thing about EMV, it, it's really a next generation security um, framework for uh, transaction processing. Now, there are certain things that may be challenging to get at to be able to facilitate that in a card not present situation. Um, some layers that, that are not quite there today, um, but I do believe that uh, it does provide um, the transaction messaging layer that when these additional components are available, it would enable that type of, uh, of security function. Thank you, Guy. Any other uh, comments from the group? Yeah, it's, it's Amr. I think uh, I think it does provide for that, and, and and Oliver and Simon may 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 have some comments on the UK specific. Uh, some of the some of the issuers in the UK issued some uh, uh, some card readers that allow for an extension of EMV to you know sort of a um, you, you, a, a sleeve that you insert your card in. It generates a one-time um, password or PIN or whatever it is that you want to call it that gets entered on the EMV transaction and allows that for completion. I think one of the more interesting pieces is what will happen with NFC and and mobile phones and how uh, how the authentication will will be completed there in combination with EMV and I I think that will still evolve. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So I'm sorry, you had a follow up Simon? I, I, I was just going to add on to what, what Amr said there and there are in fact Amber. Um, these devices, they're called app readers or um, um, token generators, one-time password generators, and there are something like 30 million of them in Europe, largely used for e-banking today, but there's um, inherent with chip the ability to use the keys in the card to generate that dynamic one-time token that can then be entered into the e-commerce shopping channel or even spoken over the phone on a mail order telephone order. So the chip does allow for that capability. It's what, you know, it's doing that cost-benefit analysis again to say, um, are we seeing enough fraud in that channel to make it worthwhile to, to have the investments in it? But it certainly does bring that to the table. And, and this is, Guy, let me just add one more thing. That, and as he mentioned, there's the DPA and there's the MasterCard implementation of these card readers out there. But I think to really get this type of adoption for your card not present, it's when the NFC phone is out there because then you don't need a separate device to do it. And, and as Amir brought up in his presentation, you know, changing the consumer behavior is a big part of it. So once they get used to using the phone, which will basically be implementing EMV technology into it and coupling that with a, um, a um, internet transaction from your home computer or something, now that, that is a, a changer. Thank you, everyone. Uh, another question uh, directed towards Simon. Um, will Visa support EMV contactless in an offline mode for uh, markets like transportation where transaction speed is, is important? And a follow-up to that is um, would um, either online or offline capability support um, use of a PIN in the uh, implementation of EMV in the United States? Uh, very good questions both. Before I answer, I want to draw a distinction between the two components of an offline transaction. So you, basically the one component of an offline transaction is what's known as offline data authentication and this is the ability of a terminal to authenticate a card without network connectivity. But the second component is offline authorization and this is the ability of the card to manage risk, the open to buy risk, um, on behalf of the issuer or as a proxy for the issuer. So to answer the question, with respect to offline authorization, the answer is unlikely. In other words, it's unlikely we will support offline authorization in the US. And the reason for that is we're an always online authorized environment today and there's really no need to go backwards and start supporting something that's not necessary. However, in the case of transit, especially if you are looking to enter into a turnstile, in other words, the type of transaction that needs to be rapidly um, authenticated, we are considering looking at offline data authentication 
which could then be followed after the, um, the user or the cardholder has gone through the turnstile with an online authorization, we are looking at that possibility for transit, yes. Uh, so that's, that's the answer to the offline versus online uh, uh, piece. With respect to PIN, that's an, an, another uh, question which needs to be broken into two components. The use of EMV allows for actually multiple what we call cardholder verification methods. And so you are capable of supporting both signature, offline PIN, as well as online PIN. All of these different um, cardholder verification methods may be supported on the same plastic. Now, with respect to, to PIN in general, online PIN is there today and will need to be there for the foreseeable future with respect to, uh, you know, cash back, with respect to Magstripe debit cards. And as, as mentioned by Guy, that certainly can continue to be supported even if you move to chip. In fact, the online PIN capability has very little to do with EMV whatsoever. It simply is just a CVM method that, that, that is supported in addition. On the other hand, support for offline PIN adds a great deal of complexity to the management of your card because not only do you have to support online PIN, but you also have to manage the synchronization of keeping the online and the offline PIN the same. And so we don't recommend that because of the cost and complexity associated with doing that. You have to start looking for an infrastructure uh, through which you are able to do the synchronization. You also need to support uh, a technique known as scripting to reset pins, to change pins, to unblock pins. And we feel for an environment that already has an established online pin infrastructure, this is a whole lot of cost and complexity for very little gain. Thank you, uh, Simon. And um, for those on the, the webinar, we're going to go a little bit over if you want to bear with us to try to get to a few more of your questions. We realize we promised you a 2 p.m. Uh, stop, but uh, I just want to get through one or two more questions, so bear with us. Um, this question um, maybe to Oliver Manahan. Um, can you explain the difference between contactless MagStripe data and contactless EMV data and um, how that might the um, um, migration in the future. Yeah, I can certainly try. Uh, thanks, Randy. Um, as the name would uh, allude to, MagStripe data is really based on what the typical authorization and clearing method is today for magnetic stripe. So if you swipe a magnetic stripe card or you tap a contactless card that is considered magnetic stripe data, it really is the same message structure. The only notable difference is, um, and I know at least from the two major brands represented on the call here today, there there is a now a dynamic um, three-digit code that gets gen generated for a contactless transaction, but it still fits within the same message structure as a as a magnetic stripe swipe transaction. And um, EMV contactless again, and, and I think. Simon touched on this, it really uses the identical message protocol structure dynamic cryptogram as with an inserted contact chip transaction. So if you tap an EMV contactless card, it uses that same data element or field 55 with that dynamic cryptogram and sends it up to the issuer host. So it's one of those um, sort of nice pieces as you, as you migrate to a contact chip environment the whole network infrastructure, message format, et cetera, is replicated with contactless EMB. Great. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, question for uh, Guy Berg regarding smartphones. Um, is there a difference in provisioning an NFC chip for provisioning it to support an EMV payment versus a non-EMV payment? Um, that's a, that's a very good question. It's a very broad question, actually, and some other player, people on the phone may want to step in on this, too. But yes, there is a, a fairly significant. Now, there are things that, that converge in the two in that um, the application that will be placed on the phone is largely an EMV-compliant application. So some of the 
the provisioning or the issuance and personalization process will be the same, but the method of getting it out to the phone um, will change somewhat dramatically. Um, there will be new players such as the trusted service manager potentially in the in the process, and what they're going to need to be able to do is connect to the phone over the air and and open up a secure channel into what is called a secure element on the phone where the um, payment brand's NFC application, payment application is going to reside. So that gets to be um, a, a tricky process and it's a very uh, different process than what is performed today. But once that secure channel I is established, um, there's a significant overlap in the key management, the data preparation, and the actual um, personalization functions that, that are performed in that over-the-air um, personalization. Thank you, Guy. Um, any final word or comments from the other panelists? Okay, I'm afraid that we are out of time for today's session. Um, again, I want to thank you all for your great questions and, and participation today. Um, there will be a link to the audio recording available shortly after the conclusion of today's seminars, as well as a place to access the, uh, the slide deck. So if you were uh, able to participate today and thought that this was valuable, we would encourage you to share that information with your colleagues as well. Um, I'd also like to uh, conclude by making a small pitch to those who are considering registering to attend our next payments conference which will be the 2012 Payment Summit, uh, February 8th and 10th in Salt Lake City. And uh, it will be a unique payments industry event this year as we bring together the EMV payments market, the NFC mobile payments market, and the transit payments market under one venue with a showcase of each of these segments and how they're maturing both independently from each other as well as converging together um, with speed and scale that's really reshaping the payments industry in the U.S. Um, details of that information is available on the Smart Card Alliance website. So in conclusion, I want to thank you all again on behalf of the Payments Council and the entire Smart Card Alliance community for your participation today. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you again. Have a good day.